Welcome to Hoop Talks. I'm Nora Zainab next to Justin Pooney and we've brought on the one, the only Jovan Buha of The Athletic to talk us through the Lakers and their success in the postseason. Jovan, thank you so much for joining us today. And first of all, congratulations. No one thought the Lakers would be here right now, but they are. And they're making some noise about to pull 3-1 ahead of the defending champions. How is morale? How's the team? How are you feeling? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think no one other than maybe the uh, 15 players and however many coaches there are in, in the locker room. Th these days, NBA teams have like 10, 15 coaches. Uh, but, you know, outside of that locker room, uh, there weren't many people that expected the Lakers to be in the second round. Let, let's say like February 1st. Like if, if you told me February 1st, they were going to be up 2-1 uh and and potentially yeah as you said with game four coming up three one uh, on in the second round like i don't think anyone would have would have believed that so uh the, the transformation they've had since the trade deadline has, has been incredible uh you know the the league's best defense in the regular season from that point on uh league's best defense right now in the playoffs uh they've just been incredible on that end uh and and that's to say nothing of their offense which uh, continues to feature Anthony Davis, LeBron James, uh, guys like D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves uh, stepping up. So uh, really, it's it's been, I think, a, a total team effort. It hasn't been the same as, as that 2021 uh, run where uh, Anthony Davis and, and LeBron James were really doing everything for that group uh, with, with some some you know key contributions from role players. But it was a LeBron 80 heavy uh, you know attack. Whereas this year, I think it's been a little bit more balanced. Of course, defensively, I think AD is the key. But offensively, it, it kind of changes night to night who, who's the leading guy. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's been an incredible run. We'll, we'll see how long it lasts. You know, I, I think you got to give some credit to, to Golden State here where they're the defending champs. They've won four times. Uh, Steve Kerr and, and Steph Curry have seen it all. Uh, I'm sure they'll come out with some adjustments in game four. So, I think this is probably the game that decides the series. There's a big difference going back to San Francisco for game five, 2-2 two, two versus 3-1 for the Lakers with, with then, uh, you know, Golden State having two of the final three games there. So uh, I really think game four is going to be a, you know, probably the, the the best game of the series that we've seen so far and also the one that ultimately uh, determines the winner. I'm glad you mentioned the trade deadline because I think even prior to that, we saw a completely different Lakers team and the play-in was a question mark, but let alone the playoffs itself. Yep. But as you mentioned, you went out, you got D'Angelo Russell, you had Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt has been so big for your team so far. But in addition to that, you've also seen the role players for the Lakers step up in Rui Hachimura, Austin Reeves. In between the two, what do you think has been the winning factor for this team? Well, with, with Austin, Austin broke out where, you know, he, he went from coming off the bench. He was, he was kind of their sixth, seventh man, depending on the night, uh, to, to being a starting shooting guard. Someone who I think is going to get paid a lot of money this offseason. Uh, the, the most the Lakers can offer him uh, is about three years, 50.8. Uh, sorry, four years, 50.8 million. Uh, and he could easily get more than that uh, as a restricted free agent on, on the open market. Um, you know, I struggled a little bit in this series, and I, I wonder how that uh, you know, kind of affects his market, if at all. But, uh, you know, up until this point, had basically been averaging 18 points, uh, shooting over 50 percent uh, as a starter for the Lakers. So, uh, you know, to me, it really emerged as that third guy uh, and it could do it on both ends. You know, again, I think this has been a tough series for him having to match up with Clay. Uh, but I, I thought he did much better matching up against Steph uh, in, in game three. And then Rui, uh, you know, that was someone the Lakers got for, for pennies, basically <laughs> traded. Uh, Kendrick Nunn in, in three second round picks, but they ended up getting three second round picks back uh, in the Thomas Bryant trade. Uh, so essentially traded Kendrick Nunn for Rui Hachimura. And Kendrick wasn't really playing. So to, to go from that to Rui, who, who on some nights has been their, their best bench player, and uh, you know game one in Memphis uh, drops 29 points, hits five threes, and, and you know almost single-handedly wins them that game in the second half. Uh, he's just someone who is that tweener forward that they didn't really have around LeBron and AD. Uh, you know, added Jared Vanderbilt, although he's, he's more defensive-minded, more, more of a guy who's going to guard, uh, you know, guards and, and wings. Uh, but, but Rui just kind of being that guy who could slot in there in the front court, uh, can, can hit threes. You know, teams don't really guard him out there, but, but you know, he shot the ball well, uh, can, can attack in, uh, you know, the mid-post, the elbows, uh, as a, a solid mid-range jumper. 
uh, and then is also really athletic and, and can take it and, and dunk on people or, or finish inside. So I think, you know, uh, again, it's, it's kind of been a by committee thing for the Lakers, which we haven't really seen from them the, the last few years. It's been very LeBron and, and AD focused of, you know, those guys have to drop 30 plus each for the Lakers to have a chance. And that just hasn't been the case. You know, th those guys have routinely been in the low 20s or even some nights below that. And the Lakers are still competitive and, and winning these games. So uh, I think really this is probably the, the most talented supporting cast the Lakers have had around LeBron and AD. If anything, those guys not being what they were in 2020 is the only thing I can think of potentially lower, uh, you know, lowering this team's ceiling. But you know, so far it, it's been uh, again a, a dominant playoff run, and uh, that you know, for for a seven seed to to be looking at potentially a conference finals run uh, is pretty incredible. Yo, when I was reading your latest piece on The Athletic about the Lakers' defensive adjustments in Game 3, um, and what really intrigued me was when you were talking about how Jared Vanderbilt and Anthony uh, Anthony Davis kind of prepared for either a Steph 3 or a Steph drive. Can you just dive a little bit deeper into just how well Jared Vanderbilt's defensive presence has been and how it's paired with Anthony Davis, who has, as you mentioned, been the defensive anchor uh, for the LA Lakers? Yeah, Jer Jared Vanderbilt, uh, you know, if, if 80s 1A, uh, Jared Vanderbilt's 1B or, or maybe at worst number two, but uh, his ability to defend multiple positions uh, had the Steph Curry assignment uh, in games one and two. I, I thought did a, a brilliant job against him, all things considered. I mean, it, it's hard to obviously defend Steph. Uh, many have tried and, and almost all have failed or, or, or all have failed, you know, d depending on how you look at it. But uh, I think, you know, Darvin Ham deserves credit for the adjustments he made in game three. You know, I, I think one of the, the prevailing criticisms against Darvin from the, the coach, uh, I mean, from the fan base has been his lack of adjustments at times. And uh, he, he's a disciple of Mike Budenholzer, who also was <laughs> criticized for not making adjustments. And I think that uh, definitely played a part in uh, his recent, uh, you know, firing. But I think for, for Darvin to completely, you know, to, to really look at the way the Warriors were attacking them in game two, and, and then to completely shuffle, you know, all five starting, uh, you know, defenders, ended up with a different assignment in game three uh, after defending the same players in games one and two. So now you have Jared Vanderbilt off Steph, but, but on Draymond, because we know Draymond loves to screen and, and do dribble handoffs for Steph and clay. So in those instances, Anthony Davis was, was, was defending Draymond hanging back. And those guys were walking into wide open shots, but now all of a sudden you got Jared Vanderbilt defending Draymond. So you can easily switch those matchups, put Jared, on Steph or Clay and the Lakers feel great about that. So I think just those, those little subtle uh, tweaks that, that Darvin made, um, you know, putting Austin, Austin was getting cooked by Clay, putting him on Steph. Uh, he, he did, it was a much better matchup for him. Uh, you know, putting LeBron on Andrew Wiggins uh, and, and putting AD on, on Jermichael Green, where he just said, Jermichael, if you want to make five threes tonight and, and that's how we lose, go do it. Jermichael Green went 0 for three and, and AD was, wreaking havoc in the paint again and, and, and doing what he did in game one. So uh, again, I, I expect Golden State to, to counter. I don't know if that's you know, just shooting the ball better. I don't know if that's going smaller and, and making AD have to guard someone. Uh, you know, the, there's different kind of things they can do. But I, I think that the chess match of this series has been really fun. And uh, Darvin Ham moving Jared Vanderbilt around, I, I think, has been one of the, the more fun things to watch. Oh, speak of chess, Anthony Davis is one of the most important pieces in this chess match. Um, he's had a really good performance and then had a clunker. And it's kind of been that pattern throughout the last little while. Uh, why is that? And do you think he can finally string together back-to-back -to -back solid performances tonight in a crucial game four? It's funny. It, it's been odd and even games. If you look at it, mm. uh, in odd games, he's been good. In even games, he's been bad. That, that would suggest game four uh, might not be his night. Uh, I think the, the one thing with AD is that, um, you know, def I think defensively, he's been there every night for, for the most part. Um, you know, I, I think game two, the, the, there was some slippage there. Uh, but, you know, I think defense, like if, if you look at uh, his block numbers, I mean, he, he has almost 20 more blocks. Uh, he's leading the, the NBA in the playoffs and blocks. He has almost 20 more blocks than the second place uh, person in blocks right now. So like, Anthony Davis has, has had a dominant postseason defensively. And I think that's the side of the ball that isn't as glamorous, isn't as talked about as much. And you know, so there are times where, yeah, he might have 15 points, but he's completely dominated the game on the defensive end. And people are just going to look at the 15 points and be like, oh, he didn't show up tonight. He didn't play well. But like 
if you're watching the other side of the floor, you're seeing him swatting three, four you know, shots a game. You're, you're seeing guys drive into the paint and be like, oh, AD's there. I'm going to kick the ball out. Like, I mean, I had clips in my story of like, there were multiple times in that game where Warriors players completely second guessed shots at the rim or shots around Anthony Davis because he was just in their vicinity. And they're like, we're probably going to get this blocked or, or altered and we're going to look for someone else to take a shot right now. So I think his defense has always been there, but the offense is has been an issue. I think for him, it's um, you know, there's an energy component where he is expending so much energy on defense that sometimes that comes at the expense of his offense and, and just his you know uh, ability to attack from there. But I think that the key you saw in, in you know game three versus game two was game two took eleven shots. But only three of those were within five feet of the rim. He was very jump shot heavy. It was very much, okay, you're playing off me. I'm going to pull up. Uh, you know, He's very confident in his jumper. And, and some nights it's falling, some nights it's not. And I, I think those nights it's not, he has to attack the rim. And you saw that. He got two fouls on Draymond, basically just driving straight into Draymond. And the Warriors challenged one of them. Or, sorry, the Lakers. He actually got an offensive foul on one of them. Lakers challenged. It, it got overturned. But uh, I think for, for AD, it's like, go get an offensive foul, go knock someone over. And uh, I, I think, you know, for, for him, like he, he's got to kind of have that mindset of I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bigger than Draymond. I'm quicker than Looney, like throw anyone at me. I can score on them. And I, I think for him, the closer he is to the basket, the more dangerous he is just with, with his size and athleticism. So Lakers got to get him, you know, in pick and rolls and, and closer to the basket. If they continue to do that, uh, I think Golden State's going to have a really hard time defending AD. Well, we're talking about the Lakers, but we've rarely mentioned LeBron James. We can't really have that here, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> but uh, I think you pretty much mentioned why the, the supporting cast has really showed up for the Lakers, which is probably why we don't really need to see LeBron be LeBron in this series so far. But um, it's it, there's a glaring hole there. LeBron's been averaging 30 points in the play-in. He was averaging 28 points in the regular season. And then as of this, the playoffs right now, it's only 20 in terms of points. So do you see LeBron being more aggressive as the series goes on? I could see it. Uh, I, I do think, you know, the, the one thing with, with LeBron and, um, you know, I don't want to use it as an excuse by any means, but, you know, he, he is still recovering from that foot injury. He did return earlier than expected, uh, you know, as he shared in his first availability after his return, uh, he spoke with multiple doctors and all of them suggested uh, him to get season ending surgery. And the one doctor that didn't, uh, was the LeBron James defeat, and he chose to go with that doctor, uh, and you know ultimately do some some rehab and and, and come back earlier than expected. Again, you know, even if he didn't have the season-ending surgery, uh, everything I was hearing, everything other people were reporting uh, was you know, LeBron's going to be back maybe the last three or four games of the regular season. He comes back with eight games left, uh, you know, about a week, week and a half earlier, and uh, you know I, I think. Has had some good moments, and and I thought in game three started to look more like himself. But there have been too many times where he just doesn't have that that burst, that athleticism, that lateral quickness uh, defensively that that we've been so accustomed to with, with him for for twenty years. And honestly, seeing like I I forgot who shared it on on Twitter, but I saw recently a kind of a highlight package of LeBron before the injury, and like looks like a totally different guy. So. I, and, and that was still in year 20, you know, I, with, with him at 38. So I think he's really been hampered by that injury. Now, with that said, uh, game three, first quarter, D'Angelo Russell goes off, scores the first 11 points, 13 in the quarter. And LeBron is in, is in uh, you know, quarterback mode. He, he's uh, commanding the offense, six assists in the first quarter, doesn't take a shot in the first quarter for the first time in his playoff career. So I think with all these weapons and, and toys that he has at his disposal, he is looking to get those guys going. That's kind of how LeBron has always been. He's always been more of a first quarter, second quarter. I'm kind of reading the defense. I'm reading how the game's going. Third quarter, fourth quarter, I'll ramp it up if needed. So I think that's kind of in line with, with where he's at. I don't, I don't think he's had to do as much necessarily. There's probably been a game or two where where he, he could have ramped it up more and, and either couldn't or just didn't. And, and I think the Lakers kind of needed that. Uh, but I, I think to get to where the Lakers want to get to, which is winning a championship, be it the rest of this round, uh, next round if they advance, or, or the finals if they get there, 
they are going to need those vintage LeBron performances. They're going to need a few of them. And if he can't summon that, uh, again, due to age, fatigue, injury, whatever it is, uh, I think that's a problem. And that's something that will ultimately hold the Lakers back. Uh, but if he can, and maybe he's just saving his bullets that, that he's got left and he's only got a few left. So he, he's going to really you know, wait to use it until the Lakers really, really need it. Uh, then I think they can go far and potentially win a championship. But uh, to me, like LeBron, more often than not, has to be the best offensive player on the floor. He showed that in the regular season. He showed that before his injury. We have rarely seen that guy since then. But again, I don't know how much of that's just him managing the injury, managing his workload, his energy, versus he just can't do it right now because of that. So that's something I'm, I'm fascinated by because that, to me, really determines this Lakers ceiling. Yo, one last question quickly. Um, Bronny James committed to USC over the weekend, Fight staying on. close to home. And LeBron <laughs> said, reminded everybody that he's still serious about playing with Bronny. Uh, do you think he actually does leave the Lakers and plays wherever Bronny goes? Uh, well, he, he recently, uh, a couple of months ago, when, when he talked about it, he, he kind of changed his stance on playing with him on the same team and, and, and sort of was softened it a little bit. It was more like, I just want to be on the same floor as him and, and uh, you know, be in the league at the same time as him. So uh, I think there's a, you know, if Bronny makes the NBA after his freshman year, after his sophomore year, you know, whenever uh, LeBron will likely still be playing. And, uh, you know, I, I think they'll be able to share the floor together. Now, whether he's willing to leave the Lakers uh, and, and, you know, go elsewhere, I think that's still kind of TBD. Uh, I don't, I don't think he wants to go to a lottery team and, and kind of, toil away at the end of his career uh just to play with Bronny necessarily but um you know that that was his previous stance so I I don't you know to you know to your point it did kind of sound like that uh, again when he just recently spoke about it uh but earl- a little bit earlier in the season a couple months ago he did sort of change it where it was more like I just want to be on the floor at the same time as him it doesn't have to necessarily be on the same team so uh, I I think that's the thing to watch like we, you know we, we got to see how Bronny develops right now. He, he's looking like a potential first round pick, uh, but mm-hmm. a, a lot can happen. A lot can change um, in, in his freshman year. So I think you know the, the timeline definitely matters as well. Uh, LeBron has you know, one more year as a Laker before he can opt out. So, uh, you know, for sure next season, he'll, he'll be a Laker. You know, Bronny will be in college. But beyond that, I think it depends on how this postseason goes. I think it depends how next season goes. And then uh, it, it depends maybe what city Bronny ends up in, right? Like, uh, I, I think um, maybe he ends up in Toronto, uh, you know, but but that versus Orlando, I, I don't know if LeBron's going to Orlando again uh, after being in the bubble for a few months. But Are you, uh, if you're telling me that James family could come to Toronto, you're up right no. now, Jovan, you're, no. it's Monday Uh-oh. morning. I might be staking Uh-oh. too high. You're just like, no. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Well, game four is tonight in L.A. The Lakers take on the defending champions, hoping to go up 3-1. And we'll see if LeBron's going to be at the shooting range tonight or working quarterback once again. Thank you so much, Jovan, for joining us today from The Athletic. You can find him everywhere on socials at Jovan Buha. We'll leave it at the bar the below as well. And uh, thank you so much for coming on here. We'll see you guys next time.